the Thursday, September 19th, 2024, regular board meeting to order. And we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have a child? We do. Do we have a child? We have Miss, is it? I don't know who is introducing this. Miss Mills. Mills. Yeah. Miss Mills. I'm so sorry. <laughs> jumped or I jumped it. Up next, we have the adoption of the agenda. Our motion. Madam President, I move that we adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Do I have a second? Second. Jack. 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 Thank you, Mr. Russell. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Um, and up next, we have Mrs. Mills. I, we're going to do it right this time. Wait, Mrs. Mills. <laughs> Please come up uh, for Sugar Grove Elementary. All right. So can I start with Mr. Hudson? All right. So we'll start with Hudson. Hudson, you want to come on up? You didn't know you're the man of the day, did you? They were surprised you? <laughs> I did tell your mom, I promise. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Hudson's a fifth grader at Sugar Grove. Um, he is a caring student. He genuinely cares about others. He always says hello, speaks first, asks how your day is going, and then um, truly cares about the answer to your day and how, how you're doing in your day, too. Um, when a new student came, this is from his teacher that she shared, when a new student came to their classroom this year, um, Hudson was welcoming, welcoming encouraging, um, and she even caught him giving him a pat on the back when he did a good job in, on a math problem. Um, and she just said, for a fifth grade boy, that's pretty impressive to take someone under their wing on day one and care for him. Um, Hudson's also known for his sense of humor, um, often answering with his British accent in class <laughs> um, to questions or joking around with friends. Um, his personality is infectious. Personally, I love talking soccer with Hudson. Um, I have a daughter that plays soccer, and Hudson plays soccer too, so we talk soccer. Um, and I just wanted to remind him that your future's bright, work hard, dream big, and keep being amazing. Okay? You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, if I can have Susan, oh, you may call him up. Okay, Susan Henniger and Anne Marie Marks. All right. So Susan is in year 20 of teaching. Um, she was a first grade teacher for 15 years and then has served in Title I with us for the last five years. Anne Marie Marks has been our um, RTI interventionist, interventionist for the past six years. Um, I call them our dynamic duo. Um, they are amazing together. Um, they work hard. Um, they are conscientious. They're student-centered in every single thing they do. They go above and beyond to build relationships with our kiddos, and they're working with our kiddos that reading doesn't come easy for, and they go above and beyond to make sure that those relationships are strong and the kids want to be in their classrooms. Um, you'll also have other kids that don't go to their classrooms that want to be in their <laughs> classrooms. Um, so I think that's a compliment to them too. So um, they facilitate our data team meetings, so they're doing all of our data crunching. They are facilitating our meetings. Um, they are... Um, working with teachers, teaching our IA strategies, um, just pouring into every single person in our building, truly. Um, they support, uh, they're always smiling and positive um, to everyone around. They cultivate a feeling of fun and love throughout Sugar Grove, and we're just so thankful that they're part of our Sugar Grove family. So thank you both for the incredible work you do.
Next we have um, public comments. We have one person, uh, Charity Flores, and I think you know, I think you know the rules, but uh, just name an address and just keep it to three minutes, please. Good evening, I'm Charity Flores and my address is 2927 Coventry Lane. Good evening board, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you related to the budget this evening. Since May, I've been engaging with members of the community and three things have risen to the top in relationship to the budget that I would like to share. First, I've heard a lot of conversation around the new facilities that are being built on the campuses. And members of the community, um, especially those who don't have kids in schools, have really struggled to understand um, both what the purpose and use of those facilities are and how it was determined that there was a need for some of those spaces. Um, obviously, they continue to worry about their taxes and what other facilities may be on the horizon, and several have indicated that it's been a little bit unclear. The second point that I'd like to raise is about special education students. Again, this is an area of passion for me to ensure that students have the right supports. Parents have raised concern that this population does receive specific allocations in the budget, um, but they're struggling to understand where some of that money is going and really how that money is being used to serve their students. There's little information available publicly to share with them about how that distribution is being applied. And given some of the recent academic data, um, it's, it's problematic that we're not able to clearly address that in conversation. Then the third area is the plan for educator salaries and retainment. There's not a current plan um, being discussed right now as the negotiation happens biannually, but we do have lingering concerns in terms of the long-term plan so that Center Grove can remain competitive and ultimately keep good teachers in Center Grove. We have both teachers and students currently leaving, which are impacting our overall budget considerations. We know turnover is high. Sometimes teachers are driving to other schools in the same county just to have a few extra hundred dollars. Again, um, voters are grappling to understand these issues. I know the budgeting process is complex, but I think taking the time to explain where and how the money is being spent is really important to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, next up are the consent items. Uh, does anybody have any questions, comments? No, do I have a motion? Madam President, I move that we approve the consent items as presented. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. Do I have a second? I have second. Thank you, Jane. Um, okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes 5 0. <laughs> um, action item 7.1. Dr. Taylor will talk about the supplemental personnel report, I believe, actually. Mrs. Brown. Mrs. Brown's going to, yes. Thank you. Per Indiana Code 20-26-5-11.2, I'm asking that the board approve the supplemental personnel report this evening. Any questions? No? Do I have a motion? Madam President, I move that we accept the supplemental person now report as presented. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Russell. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Mm. Right. Oh, we we skipped. Oh, we man. did. Part of it. Go ahead. 
Thank, Thank you. you. While I'm up here, we do have a special item on our personnel report this evening. Lots of special items, but one in particular. As we approach the 24-25 school year, we had a lot of different staffing changes, and those staffing changes really allowed us to build up some of our Center Grove teacher leaders, and I'm really excited to bring up Dr. Hart because he's going to give an example of one of those with Ms. Sierra Hunter. So come on up, Dr. Hart. Thank you so much. Uh, you just approved Sierra Hunter, our new Dean of Students at Middle School North. And she is, uh, has Center Grove roots, and she is just uh, going to raise the ceiling for our school. Mrs. Hunter has 21 years of experience in education. She comes to uh, Middle School North from Pleasant Grove Elementary, where she's taught fourth grade for the last four years. Um, <clears throat> in 2023, she was the Pleasant Grove Teacher of the Year. And she's also worked as an instructional assistant and an assistant director at a, at a preschool. Um, she received her bachelor's degree in elementary education from Indiana University and will complete her master's degree in educational leadership in December. Uh, she replaces Heidi Height, who was our dean of students and now has been promoted to assistant principal. Uh, I would say that uh, one of the things that has really impressed us about Sierra is that she comes to Middle School North every morning and puts in time helping us before she goes to Pleasant Grove to uh, teach for the day. And those are the kind of atomic habits and work and um, effort that we're so proud of. So her husband, Travis, is currently in Texas uh, yeah. on a trip. Um, and he, he works for IMPD as a motorcyclist, and he's down there performing. Um, she has a Center Grove grad, Elliot. Um, and she also has a daughter named Elena in seventh grade at Middle School North. And then Vivian is a fourth grader at Pleasant Grove. So very happy to bring her on. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I personally have known Mrs. Hunter since my youngest was three, so she has my heart for sure. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, action item 7.2 is an awesome one and I'm so excited and I already have my tissues but um, uh, yep we are going to have Dr. Long take thank you this one. thank you tonight we're asking the board to approve a resolution to name the teacher legacy award after uh, to name the teacher legacy award the Gary L Robinson legacy award uh, tonight we've asked Dan Anderson uh, our 2023-24 corporation teacher the teacher of the year to attend and to read the resolution. And if you knew Dan and or Gary, you know they had a friendly competition on who's gonna win the most legacy awards uh, <laughs> over the, the time period. And so, you know, we kind of the fix is in because now every legacy award uh, will be named <laughs> Gary Robinson. So Dan can never catch up. But um, Dan was gracious enough and really was, was, was asking if he could do this because he had so much respect for mm -hmm. Gary, so Dan, if you'd come up and read the resolution that we're gonna ask the board to approve, I would appreciate it. Well, first I'd like to say what an honor this is. Um, when I was named Teacher of the Year, I knew that it was inevitable that I was gonna have to give a speech at the beginning of the year, and Bill called me this summer. He says, hey, by the way, remember you're giving a speech. And my main focus in that speech was the impact that we have as teachers, as educators, as people that work in the building, on everybody in which we come in contact. And the power of our actions and our words to the students. And I used Gary as the ultimate example of that legacy. If you worked with him, you were a better teacher. If you were taught by him, you were a better human being. And he was getting ready to do some incredible things for the school corporation as a school board member. And so to be able to um, read this resolution gives me, um, it's, it's just such, a, such an honor. And he will always have one more than I have. <laughs> Every year I'd get the call, hey, plus one, how you doing? <laughs> so the, <clears throat> do I read all of this? Yes, please. Okay. The resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Center Grove School Corporation honoring Gary L. Robinson. Whereas the Center Grove Community School Corporation, by and through its Board of School Trustees, 
is the authorized agent for purposes of managing, maintaining, and otherwise overseeing school property. And whereas Gary L. Robinson was a tireless and lifelong advocate for students and the Center Grove Community School Corporation, and whereas Gary L. Robinson was consistently recognized as an outstanding teacher by his students and peers, and whereas Gary L. Robinson was a dedicated and faithful servant to the Center Grove Community School Corporation through his service as a faculty member, coach, and school board member for more than 38 years. And whereas Gary L. Robinson was widely known for many accomplishments in the classroom and as a coach, and widely known in the Center Grove community for the pass <laughs> in the 1972 regional basketball finals against Richmond, and whereas the Center Grove School Community School Corporation, by and through its board of school trustees, believes it proper and fitting to honor Gary L. Robinson for his dedication, leadership, and exemplary commitment to the Center Grove Community School Corporation. And whereas Gary L. Robinson perfectly exemplified the characteristics of a teacher deserving of the Center Grove Legacy Award by academically challenging his students, motivating and pushing students to do their best, being a positive role model, and holding students to high, and I would say the highest standards. And whereas the School Board of Trustees determines it is most appropriate to recognize the dedication and commitment Gary L. Robinson has shown to the Center Grove School community by honoring him for his service, by naming the Center Grove Community School Corporation Teacher Legacy Award in his honor. Now, therefore, the Center Grove Community School Corporation Board of Trustees does hereby resolve as follows. One, the Center Grove Community School Corporation's Legacy Award hereafter be named the Gary L. Robinson Legacy Award. Bill, can you finish? Thanks. Number two, the Center Grove Community School Corporation Administration is authorized to take all reasonable steps necessary to designate and identify the award as the Gary L. Robinson Legacy Award and that a copy of this resolution shall hereafter be maintained in the official records of the Center Grove Community School Corporation, all which is adopted this 19th day of September, 2024. Thanks, ma'am. Thanks. Do I have a motion? Can we have the record reflect we all five moved to approve? this uh, resolution. I don't think you need a second if you do that. <laughs> you are correct, sir. Nope, motion passes fast. Nope, got a vote. Nope. Oh, we got a vote, vote still. Yeah. Sorry, That's sorry. Right. Oh, <laughs> I know, yeah. I know, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. The motion passes 5-0. We get a, can we get you come up and take a picture with the school board?
items. Okay. Action item 7.3. Um, approve the comprehensive social climate inventory. All right, thank you so much. Um, as you all may remember, in the school year of 2019, 2020, Center Grove completed the CSCI survey to get a baseline on current climate and culture at each of our school buildings. However, you might remember in 2020, we went into a global pandemic. So we weren't able to do much with those results as we were shifting gears. So we would like to um, come back to that as we know that it is important um, for our students to be able to learn at high levels that they have a positive culture and climate. And if we don't ask our students and stakeholders and guardians about that, um, we can't build a plan. We'd like to use the National School Climate Center to complete the survey again this year. It is nationally recognized and normed survey that provides an in-depth profile for our school community, particular strengths, as well as areas for improvement. So we would like to offer the opportunity to all Center Grove families, students in grades three through 12, um, and family members um, and staff to be able to take the survey. It is anonymous. Um, we will administer it and offer it to families uh, starting after fall break. We're looking at October 21st through November 1st would be the window for completion. After we get those results, each school building will work to create an action plan in order to improve our school culture and climate to learn at high levels. Um, as you can see, there's examples of questions linked here um, and also the dimensions that the survey covers. It covers 14 different dimensions that follow in, in the area of safety, teaching and learning, entrepreneurs, interpersonal relationships, school environment, and leadership. Um, due to the intellectual property and purpose of the students' questions, we aren't able to post them publicly. You have to sign an NDA to view them. Um, so we will house those here at central office for families and stakeholders to view. They'll be asked to sign that NDA to view them. Um, and then we will also allow an opt-out for families um, who would not like their students to participate. So there will be a parent square coming um, in the near future with those exact dates that the surveys will be here for families uh, stakeholders to come look at, and then we will provide again that opt out option for our families. Any questions? Any questions? Anyone? So. I have a motion. Madam President, I move that we approve comprehensive school climate inventory. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Evans-Smith. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, action items 7.4 are the school improvement plans, and I believe Dr. Summers will provide us with some more information. Thank you. So per Indiana code, all public schools um, must annually submit a school improvement plan um, outlined in legislation. Also, these plans must be submitted to and approved by um, the governing body of the school district. This year's plans are required to be submitted to the Indiana Department of Education by October 1st, which is why we're bringing them to you um, this evening. So each Center Grove school um, over the summer and at the beginning of the school year um, takes time to review and consider the student per current student performance data that they have so that they can revise those plans accordingly and ensure that they are meeting staff and student needs for the current year. Um, the student achievement goals for each school is the basis for those strategies and professional development that is delineated in the action plans that were included in your board packet. Our elementary schools this year are going to continue to focus on increased reading achievement and the development of those proficient readers um, as measured through iRead and iLearn. Our secondary schools have developed goals to reflect student achievement in both language arts and math um, as measured through <laughs> iLearn and SAT at those respective levels. So that's some data that we're taking a look at. Um, the plans for approval tonight do include um, as you can see on the screen, benchmarks, performance data, strategies, outcome, um, outcomes, research, professional development to support those strategies that they're looking to implement. Um, obviously, the goal is improve teaching and learning as part of this process or improve student academic achievement. Um, 
A summary has been included. I am asking for your approval this evening of these nine plans so that we can submit them to the Indiana Department of Education. We do have the principals of the elementaries and middle schools here, and Mrs. Perkins is here to represent the high school should you have specific questions about those action plans. Questions? Any questions for our principals? I, I don't know if it's a question as much as it is, well, probably more of a thought or a comment. I mean, obviously, our, as we've talked about, our demographics are changing, um, making, based on reading this, so I'm making some assumptions we are building into our school improvement plans to help the varying different demographics that we have. As we get the data back, I'm assuming we're going, at least the administration and the principals and the board will eventually see the data broken down by subgroups, by mm -hmm. subgroups and applying the plan to the subgroups and that makes sense to me. Correct. So if you were, if you look at some of the data that they did take a look at, they are looking at those subgroups of populations. Yep. Um, there are ta target populations included in their action plans. Yep. So each school is looking at those, those achievement gaps so that the strategies and professional development that we're applying to in, within those plans are addressing those needs. So yes, you are correct. I think it's also important for us to remember that when we're looking at iRead, iLearn, and SAT data, those would be what we would call lagging indicators. So we're getting, we're getting them later. We're right. using them as the basis for moving forward. But in the throes of all of that, our administrators and teachers are using a series of other pieces of assessment data or student achievement data to, to monitor where we're at in the process as we're moving forward so that we can adjust um, and be agile to address the needs as we're moving along. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Madam President, I move that we approve the school improvement plans as presented. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. <coughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. I want to thank all the principals and your staff for the work that you guys have put into this. This was, when I was reading through these, this was, was well thought out and everybody looking at their schools. It's okay to look out slightly different because all of them are a little bit different. And as I was reading through the plans, that, that actually came through in the plan and I appreciated that fact, so. And I, I would add, if you would think that all they have to do is plug and chug every year, but as you mentioned, with the change of population in the EL, there's no plugging and chugging. <laughs> Kids, your your people change pretty monthly for you. So this does it, it's a lot of work by a lot of people. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, action item seven point five. Uh, rejoining the Central Indiana Educational Service Center and Dr. Long. Thank you. Tonight we're asking the board to approve the corporation uh, to rejoin the Central Indiana Education Service Center. You've probably heard it called CISC. Um, CISC is a nonprofit providing free and at cost educational programs throughout Central Indiana and beyond. Last year they served over 180 schools and organizations to better education to better their educational experience for over 195,000 students. Uh, we used to belong to CISC probably, um, what, through, two, 2015. through 2015 and then withdrew. Um, having, we met with them, they came down, their staff came down and talked to us and talking to other school corporations surrounding us, almost everyone else is, is a, a member of that and felt like they had some uh, opportunities for, our, for grant money and for us to work with them uh, as, as well as uh, some collaborative uh, opportunities, re, uh, uh, purchasing uh, school buses, school uh, meals, lunch, or food. So we feel that there were many reasons to join and we're recommending approval tonight. 
No. Yes. Just more professional development type things. They do offer um, driver's ed for our high school students, and but most of it's professional development. Other questions, comments, concerns? No? Do I have a motion? Madam President, I move that we rejoin the Central Indiana Educational Services Center. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5 0. <clears throat> okay. Um, this evening, we have the hearing for the um, 2025 budget. Uh, no board action is required tonight. Um, do you want to do you want to say anything, or do you want me to? Yeah, go ahead and turn it over. There's a couple okay. lines oh. in there. Yep. If you could. Yeah, go ahead. And go ahead and read the board president. Okay. Um, all right. So this evening's board meeting has been appropriately advertised as a hearing on the 2025 budget, the bus replacement plan, and the capital capital projects fund plan. I now open this public hearing, and I would like to call on Dr. Taylor to provide an update on the budget. Thank you very much, Mrs. Council. I will uh, move through quickly. Most of these slides are very similar to what we've used in the past, and the format's the same. Um, and so tonight we're going to cover some important dates. Um, all of the necessary documents were posted online on September 3rd, um, well over 10 days before this meeting today. I do want to point out um, the board's just going to hear the budget tonight. You move to take action, we'll ask you to take action on that. And that date has changed. Originally, we'd advertise that for October 24th. It's moved up to the October 10th. It's also going to be a 7.30 start time. I know Ms. Council covered this probably at the end of the meeting. Um, but that was a change, and that's also been changed on the uh, announcements that are online. Um, so just a quick summary, we're going to cover enrollment changes. We have, to we have to cover these areas each year, so we want to make sure we hit them. The capital asset plan, the bus replacement plan, uh, major budget changes, expenditure comparison, total tax rates, operating balance, and then just a real quick summary slide where you can get more information. Enrollment, this was a positive year for Senate Girls Schools. We've had many positive years um, in enrollment growth. We're up about 115 students um, as of 9-9 when we publish these documents. Um, we're up even about five more since then, so we continue to watch this. Official count day will be October 1st. Um, the budget itself was actually designed on an enrollment of 9610, so we're right in that ballpark, great place to be. Um, and that would equate to about $6,900 per student in basic tuition support. Um, one requirement of this evening is that we talk about a capital asset plan, and this is a plan for, um, in, for projects and assets that value over $10,000. Um, since 2010, we've actually supplemented the revenue in the, what was at the time Capital, Pro Capital Projects Fund um, through GO bonds. We will do that again in 2025 um, with bonds totaling the amounts of $8 million. And that just helps us with the shortfalls that come in that operations fund each year. So here you can see an actual breakdown of where that money would be spent. Um, the column in the that says operations 2025 is money that will actually come out of the operations fund. And then the bonds 2025 is how we'll supplement and make sure we have enough revenue in place for the necessary expenditures in these funds. Um, the largest lines come in maintenance and, trans and technology, um, but there, are, there is some, some money included for security. And then on the second slide, um, for the purchase of school buses and student devices. Um, those are two new things this year as we've had some changes in those areas. So our operations fund was not able to support. Uh, scroll back up one for me, Ms. Stafford, sorry. Thank you. Um, was not able to support the purchases of buses anymore. It's something we did to free up some operating revenue. And then also with the change in curriculum materials funding, we had to come up with a source um, to fund our student devices. And so this, those bonds are being used for both those items as we move forward into 25. We'll look real quick on the next slide at that bus replacement plan. We are going to turn in eight buses every year and maybe even nine if we get lucky in 2028. Um, but you'll see the cost of buses are going up. Um, there's, that's the estimated, estimated replacement cost of a new bus. Um, if you were to divide that by eight, you'd get about 179. Um, a couple of those are mid buses, and so that helps with it. We do trade those in on the same rotation. All right, so let's talk about major changes, major increases in revenue this year. And so we did receive just under a million dollars in new money and base formula fund revenue. Um, on top of that, then, with our growth, it was another $800,000 for the 114 new students. 
um, 705,000 in additional special education revenue. Some of that came last year during our December count and it runs all the way through this year. So some of that we've realized earlier in the year. Um, vocational is up just a little bit at about 200,000 since last year. Um, honors grant revenue didn't change a lot, um, but it is up 120,000. Um, and that will continue to grow as our enrollment grows and our students have success. Um, we did have a great year in interest, and so this is the second year in a row we've actually raised our interest income. Um, might have to go down, as I understand. The Fed made some changes this week. So um, as we look forward to the future, that number will probably start ticking back down, but that's been very helpful in the past couple years. And then we were allowed to grow the operations fund by that 4% number, and you can see that's about 530000 So all that together, we get about $3.4 in new revenue this year. Now we start talking about how we had to maybe lose a little bit of revenue. And last year, the slide was pretty red. Um, it's not as bad this year. Um, we did have to adjust our amount that we'd put out for the curricular materials. Um, we call it a free textbook mandate. Um, while we are very excited and supportive that our parents don't have to purchase textbooks anymore, it, it was underfunded. Um, we did have to set aside last year 850,000 to meet our curricular needs. And this year we had to increase that just slightly to 70,000 as some of those revenues had fallen off entirely. Um, and then excise and income tax, these do fluctuate from year to year and they're typically in, in um, a year or two behind. So we are a little behind on excess, the excise tax and the local tax revenue. All that together though, we just lost 170,000 in revenue that we had had in the prior year. So then we look at what else changed in our budget. Um, this was a unique year. We had, a, we had agreed to a two-year bargaining agreement, so we actually were able to provide our salary increases in July this year instead of waiting until October, November, December, and doing a retro. So you can see there the three raise amounts and the cost associated in total was $700,000. Um, that was a 1% increase for the administrators and support staff. And then for our teachers and the entire collective bargaining agreement, it was 1.43% of an increase. So. Um, we agreed to some language to do a 1% raise there, and then we also had a teacher retention catch up, and that represents the additional money in that area. And that caught up some teachers who had been with Center Grove five, 10, 15, or 20 years or longer. So it's a great, great provision to have in there. Um, this was also the last year for the three big funds from the federal government following the 2019 COVID pandemic. So ESSER funds, CARES funds, and American Recovery Plan funds. Um, we had been planning for this for a couple years, so this wasn't a crazy number, but it was one we had to work into the budget or decide if we needed these staff. Um, we did decide to keep and retain the staff members listed here. So the first line, it's 12 people, but really they just got an hourly um, pay rate difference. So they're not just a classroom assistant, they actually teach a group of students. Um, they're not just assisting a teacher as they teach. And so that's something we've done during COVID to help with that, um, and to catch the kids up and get them back up to pace. Um, and so we decided to retain that. Um, we also, had, at the time, had had a, a data receptionist slash Simon Youth Academy receptionist. We, need, we needed to hang on to that. Um, they still need that person to operate that program. Um, we had included an SSO, a school safety officer, and a school resource officer as well, um, a half of one. So we absorbed both of those. And then our safety and security train, integration training specialist. So um, that being said, it's not a, a, a huge amount of money um, for us to absorb. We had been thinking and preparing for it. Um, we're, we're glad the board and, and the corporation had some foresight in this. I know some schools are really struggling at absorbing this money this year. And so we were glad to be ahead of that. Um, we then added some new positions during staffing at almost a million dollars in total. And you'll see there were no new administration or support staff members added at this time. Um, and it was 13 classroom teachers that make up that number. Part two of budget changes, because we had a bunch this year. Um, we did get a, um, a recommendation from the Indiana Teachers Retirement Fund and their board had approved um, and mandated that we had to increase our contribution by half a percent. Um, and when most of our staff are certified teachers or administrators, that there's the cost of that half percent. So we did, we did work that into the budget. For health insurance, since we're in that two-year agreement, we didn't need to make any recommendations to employee premiums. Um, what we have here is budgeted amount of money so that we could make some premiums starting in July next year if we need to um, for the last six months of 25, and you'll see that amount there. Health plan's operating really well. Um, got a great renewal from Anthem, and it's gonna bring those costs down. So um, we're excited to, to bring this number and show no increase to our employees. 
Unfortunately, insurance is a big deal. Um, and not just because of what happened here a couple weeks ago, but insurance rates statewide have gone up after our events that have happened in the past few years. And so we really did have to incur quite a bit in property casualty and bus insurance cost. And that, that 150,000 is honestly a 20 to 25% increase of what we were paying. Um, and we are marketing that, we shop it, we get it audited, we do check, but um, it, it's just unfortunately the cost of living um, where we live with what's happened in the prior years. Um, and the biggest thing is, is roof and wind damage. Um, that's the biggest thing that the, the state's really struggling with. Um, fortunately, we did not include any increase for utility or gasoline. This is probably the first year and maybe forever that we haven't had to do this. Um, and it's directly in part to the guaranteed energy savings uh, contract that we started. Um, we were able to turn those savings right around and reduce those costs or negate the need for an increase in those areas. While we aren't seeing all of those savings yet because they're still working on getting that equipment up and running, we do expect to see a lot of that starting in January. Um, some systems are online this month even. And then no additional money was set aside for tax caps, and that is also something that, if you want to go to the next slide, we haven't been able to say or do for a while. Um, tax caps in our area have just been increasing ever so slightly, and then in 22, they really took off. And you'll notice that they doubled from 22 to 23. Well, last year when I presented this budget, we had expected them to almost double again to go to about 4.1 um, million. With the property tax relief, that's directly for homeowners. We actually saw all of our tax cap properties contributed about 5% extra in tax revenue, not just to us, but to all of the, the township, the schools, the fire departments. And so it really did mitigate those cap losses. And we almost for the first year collected um, as much or more money than we had in the past year in, ca in actual property tax revenue. So it, it, if you're familiar with this, it's we ask, we expect to tax, we go out, we ask for this, we know we have these con constitutional limits, and that kind of takes the, the revenue back. Um, now, we are seeing a significant jump, though, in 25. Um, we still do expect it to go back up to 3.9, and then again following that. Now, we don't know what's going to happen to the General Assembly this year, so all could change again. Um, but we did get a couple years of relief from this chart growing beyond the bounds of my, my slide there. So um, exciting news for us. All right, just some quick summary then as we look at our actual budget. Both the Education and Operations Fund are balanced. Um, you can see the revenue versus their expenditures. And in the Debt Service Fund, we're going to draw down just a little cash balance to offset some of our costs there. Um, that always happens with some rounding. We either add to cash balance or we reduce. Um, and so that's what that is. Um, we're operating a $125, $125 million budget entirely um, in its total. And where do we source that? Well, the education fund I talked about earlier, that's primarily funded from, um, from the, the state government through income, uh, income taxes and sales tax. Um, but then the operations and debt service fund actually come from local property taxes. This year we're recommending to the board a flat tax rate to not increase it. You'll know that we did increase that last year, and I've got a slide on that here in a moment. Um, and that was to pay for that um, guaranteed energy savings contract and the debt associated with it. Um, but as we advertise this, we always advertise high because um, we also have to live with this amount come January. And so in January, when all of the tax settlements are made and, and settled up, and we all know what people are going to pay in 2025, we always want to be high in case um, we made a calculation error or assessed value was wrong. And so that's why we advertise $1.18, but we really expect to fall right where we were last year. And we will manipulate it to be there. Um, the board has been very consistent in, in maintaining that $1.04 or less property tax rate. Last year, we did recommend... Um, a slight increase of that of two cents to that dollar six amount. Again, that was to provide for the guaranteed energy savings, which we're already reaping the benefits of, and we're seeing those operational dollars. Um, when we talk about what that one dollar and six cents tax rate looks like in our county, on the next slide, you'll see Center Grove comes in fourth out of all five public schools in Johnson County. Um, the three above us are Franklin, Clark Pleasant, Edinburgh. They also have gener they also have operating referendums that provide annual additional income through property taxes. That's in the blue segment. You'll see even without those referendums, though, we still would be in the fourth spot. Um, a very good bang for your buck here in Center Grove and what you can get for an education for the dollar six cent rate. Um, as we look at how that rate then would apply to a local taxpayer, because we didn't change our rate, the school tax rate will not change before or after being property tax capped. What will change is what I mentioned earlier, that supplemental deduction is going to change a little bit at the state level unless they extend it. Um, it went from 40% down to 35. It'll go back to the, or it went from 35 to 40. It'll go back to the 35 next year um, without ex extension. So you'll see some tax bills may change, but the bottom line on the school tax will not. 
And finally, how does this all shake out at the end of the year? Well, at the end of 2023, we ended up with just under 10% in operating cash balance. Um, you'll see that's up about half a million from the prior year. Um, part of that was due to the property tax cap um, losses that we did not have to incur. And so that's right where we want to be. The board wants to remain well over 8%. Um, honestly, a lot of schools are 15 to 20%, um, but we feel like this is get, puts us in a great place that we can get through a couple months operating if something were to happen. So just in summary, uh, both the Ed Fund and Operations Funds are balanced. Enrollment's up 115 students. Our tax rate is going to remain consistent. And there's a 0% impact then on the homeowner for $3,000 within our control, for a $300,000 home within our control. Some of those other changes are outside of our control. If you did not, and if you really enjoyed what I shared and you'd like to learn more, um, you're welcome to visit. Um, Ms. Conrad and her team put together a great website for us. Um, it's linked here, it's available online. We do try to share everything that's out there and available online, um, even more than what's required by the state and the gateway system. Um, we would love to meet again on October 10th and ask for your approval of this budget. And I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Mrs. Counts, to close out the hearing. public to comment on the 2025 budget or the information presented this evening. Are there any members of the public present who would like to comment? Mr. Fick? If you just want to state your name and then um, we'll just limit to ask you to limit it to three minutes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just a, a comment here. Uh, I've been on this line on the school uh, website since the 1st of September, and I was just on it a minute ago, and I don't see this on the school website at all. Okay. Uh, we would closed like the to website tonight with the meeting, so all these documents were on there. Everything else is out on Gateway. It's on Gateway? Yeah. Where is that? Yeah, on? I'll, I'll show you after the meeting. If that's okay. Right. Yeah. All right. But... I mean, I go to the budget 2000, you know, uh, and stuff, and the 2024 budget is there, yeah. but not the 25. Yeah. So, uh, went on 7 o'clock? Yep. Went on at 7 o'clock tonight. Yeah. So we'll check. Ms. Conrad and I are here. We'll and four, to in three weeks, you're going to vote and accept this budget, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't understand that, but. Uh, yeah, happy to meet with you. All right, fine. Thank you. I now close this public hearing. Are there any board members who have any questions or comments? I, just a refresh of the, of the memory. Um, our financing folks recommended, and I believe it was also a result of a SBOA audit, they recommended an eight, at a minimum of an 8% mm -hmm. cash balance, and they prefer us to be closer to the 15. Mm -hmm. We used to be at four. That's where we were comfortable, and we were told otherwise by our financing folks and the State Board of Accounts to get it to at least eight, yep. correct? That is very much correct. Okay. And because of that, we do pay higher interest rates. Uh, if we were at 15 or above, our interest rates would be ever so slightly lower, but it would add up over a 20-year bond. Right. So that is something to keep in mind. Okay. Thank you for that mm -hmm. refresh. Dr. Taylor, I have a question. We, we put a lot of time last year into the year at Teen Energy Savings and, and all that we've done to, to try to save funds to, you know, be able to tighten our belt the best we can. Um, remind me reporting back on how we're doing. When, when, when should the board and the community expect yeah. a report to show us the savings? And We'd love to include that annually. I think the most appropriate time would be as we do our Board of Finance hearing in January probably. Um, and the reason I say that is because they've been <coughs> installing all summer. They started even in the spring. Some of the systems came online this month. We'll see the results on the September and then October bills. So I'd like to give you a, a, a forecast of where we're at by January. And then we'll make it more reoccurring as it all comes online. So we, um, we at least enough, know enough now that you're willing yeah. to give us a budget that yep. you want us to vote on, which says we're not going to increase in those areas. Correct. And, and part of that is because of the guarantee of it. If they don't meet those marks and those numbers, they will write a check for the difference. And so we will see these savings. We are building a budget accounting for that. But I want to show you that hopefully we exceeded their expectations. January meeting? Yep. I'll put it on there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No? Okay. 
Um, so please be aware that there is no board action to be taken tonight. Uh, the board will approve the budget at its next regular board meeting on October 10th, 2024. Um, all right, announcements. So October 14th to 18th uh, is fall break, no school. And like Dr. Taylor had announced earlier, our next board meeting will be at 7.30 p.m. on October 10th, 2024. Uh, do we have any board comments? Jack, would you like to start? Uh, I talked to you earlier about my board of directors meeting of ISPA. Um, one of the kind of lighthearted things that Dr. Jenner brought up was she ordered a AI paper, 2,000 words, on paper on school board partisan <laughs> possibilities. After they went through it, it had at least 100 mistakes. <laughs> so. Just that's something we need to keep an eye on, on the usage of AI and how we're going to use it and so forth uh, on that one. But uh, the only other thing would be by mid next year, ISBA will have the president of NSBA and the president of COSPO. <laughs> Those are our two <laughs> competing. And so far, they've been gentle about their competition. <clears throat> uh, it's just one of those happenstance that comes on, and they're two great guys. So. Be interesting to see where it all goes. Hmm. Anything? I don't have anything at this time. Okay. Nothing tonight. Thank you. Um, things over at uh, Central Nine are going well. Their enrollment was up from last year. I want to say call that number eighty-seven students, I believe. Um, they. Uh, did the open house for their uh, new welding facility and their new LGI room, both very impressive. Um, I was able to get a, a tour of everything over at T9 with Dr. Kovacs and, and our students are well represented over at T9. So I'm excited and continue to learn. And then Johnson County Redevelopment Commission meets on Monday and um, we're gonna get a little bit of an overview about maybe how to spend some of the funds there for some redevelopment along I-59. That's all I got. Okay. All right. Well, I don't have anything either. So after the board meeting, we'll reopen um, for Good for the Grove. So I will adjourn this meeting.